start it without you. Don't have a meeting. I'd like to call the meeting to order at uh, 10 a.m. <clears throat> I would also like to ask, as a courtesy to all, to please ensure that you have your that you've silenced your cell phone. Also, I'd like to remind our directors to turn their microphones on and off each time they speak to help with the audio and video recordings. Each director received notice of the board meeting. Public meeting notice was properly posted as required by law. Directors Munson indicated that he would not be present for this meeting. We have <clears throat> set aside at this time to hear from you, the general public, those of you that were interested in providing comments and filled out one of the cards available at the receptionist desk will be called to approach the podium to make your comments at this time. Our first speaker will be Mickey Parsons. Yeah, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Executive Director and all the members of the board, thank you for allowing the time to be, be in front of you and talk today. Uh, I am currently serving as the Mayor Pro Tem of the beautiful city of Granbury, and uh, I wanted to come talk today because I'm in an election process, and so next week at this time I may not be able to be up here. Who knows that? But I uh, wanted to come and, and talk to you today, and, and thank you for the uh, things you do for our, our state. and. Uh, for the city of Granbury. Uh, in the city of Granbury, we continue to have issues with uh, the half study and the drawdown ratios that uh, that study has uh, implemented and how they affect the city of Granbury. Uh, I wanted to ask today that the board of directors uh, be diligent and make sure that drawdown ratios for all lakes and all facilities up and down the Brazos River are fair and equitable. Uh, we think that the half study was flawed in a number of ways. Uh, there was no empirical data that we know of that supported the initiation of it. And as was evident in the last uh, drought of record, what would probably be called a drought of record, at least for North Texas, uh, it was clearly evident that the data used to base that drawdown ratio was not correct and that the city of Granbury was more impacted uh, than other lakes up and down the system. Uh, if you haven't been to our beautiful city, uh, 1880s, our, to our square is, is uh, intact from the 1880s. It's a beautiful historical square. The courthouse has been redone. It's really a beautiful square. And understand that our square is approximately four blocks from the lake. So Granbury and the city and the county of Hood there's a 31-mile lake that runs right through the middle of it. So since the 1970s, the economic development along that lake has been tremendous. I would submit that the city of Granbury probably has more ad valorem dollar values up and down that lake than any other lake on the system. So when Granbury is affected by low lake levels, which could be from drought and or from misappropriations of the water, we're highly affected. The last drought was severely impacted our tourism industry and severely impacted our ad valorem tax rates. So I would like to ask that the board become active in helping the city of Granbury have the half study renewed. We've talked about it. Uh, we've been told that we, the city of Granbury or Hood County had to get Possum Kingdom's permission to redo the half study. We think that's ludicrous. I'm not sure I understand why we should be the one doing the Brazos River Authority's work. So once again, I would implore you to assist the city of Granbury and its good citizens and the citizens of Hood County by asking management to redo the half study and having in that study make sure that economic development or economic impact is a part of that study. So once again, thank you for your service. I've enjoyed being of service to the city of Granbury. Uh, if you have an absentee ballot you'd like to give me today, I'll take it back and put it in the voter hopper for you. So, uh, but any rate, interesting part of the pol pol political system is uh, going through the election process 
But I wanted to come then and address you folk, fine folks again and tell you how much we appreciate you and hopefully you'll do what we think is right for the city of Granbury and ask for a redo of the half study. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Parsons. <coughs> we'll move to our first agenda item. Number one, report and possible discussion on physical year 2017 fourth quarter budget report by David Thompson, Chief Financial Officer. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is our fourth quarter, and this is our fiscal year end, August 31st. And I want to take a look at uh, three key financial items uh, that I like to look at on the financial statements. Uh, the first is revenue, where we were 6.1 million over budget, and that's due to additional water sales that we do not have in our budget. Second is the expenses, where we're 4.1 million under budget, and that's due to basically timing differences on employee hires during 17, as well as the Corps of Engineers had spent less than what they gave us their budget, and then the others were departments were all underspending. And the last is our projects, our capital projects, <clears throat> where we're $21 million under budget on a $24 million budget. And I think I mentioned in the last third quarter that we have uh, a number of large, complex, multi-year contracts, that it is difficult to project exactly what we're going to spend from year to year. Now, we have t uh, captured the $21 million in our FY18 budget. Uh, next, let's take a look at the details of the financial statements. Now, I've covered already the, the key variances. And last is how we spent uh, our O&M expenditures in mm -hmm. FY17 and broken down by the different percentages. And that concludes that agenda item. Were there any questions? Seeing no questions, we'll go to Agenda item number two, report and possible discussion on physical year 2017 fourth quarter investment <laughs> officer's report by David Thompson, chief financial officer. Uh, each quarter I bring to you the investment report. This is required by the Public Funds Investment Act. The first one is just taking a look at a two-year uh, trend of our portfolio. Uh, there's not much change from third quarter to fourth quarter. We're, we're right at 104 million. This takes a look at our investment blocks. And right now I have about 50% invested in money markets. And it's earning about 134 basis points, which is beating out the uh, uh, other years, uh, the other months investment blocks. Uh, we are starting to see some uh, latter years starting to increase to beat this, this number. I uh, do want to mention, though, anything that we invest is 100% collateralized. And that's required by the Public Funds Investment Act. And next is just taking a look at we're about 120 basis points average at the end of the quarter. And that's higher than the rolling one-year treasuries as well as the uh, Texas pool. Mm -hmm. And that concludes that agenda items. Are there any questions? Seeing no questions, we'll move to <clears throat> agenda item number three, discussion and possible action on surplus personal property by David Thompson. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, state statutes do require that I bring to the board any uh, personal properties that we want to surplus. Now, these are properties that we no longer need. It's not cost efficient to repair or simply uh, uh, are not working. Uh, what I'd like to do is basically uh, give you an idea by going through and looking at each of the different locations, let you look through that, and then read the resolution and obviously read the personal properties. First is Possum Kingdom. <coughs>
So once I read the agenda and you approve it, we will place these uh, personal properties out on a well-advertised uh, auction and sell the properties. So are there any questions? Please read your <coughs> resolution. Okay. Be resolved that the Board of Directors of Brazos River Authority <coughs> hereby authorize General Manager CEO to dispose of the following surplus personal properties under the terms and conditions that are in the best interest of Brazos River Authority and be it further resolved that the board authorize the general manager, CO, in certain instances to continue to use and or maintain previously authorized surplus properties in a manner that is in the best interest of Brazos River Authority until appropriate replacement property is received and placed in service. Items no longer needed or repairs not efficient. Possum Kingdom. Two Mercury Optimax 225XL outboard motors. Everloon Finch E22FPX STM outboard motor, two Intoxalizer 5000EN, two uh, eyewitness in-car VHS recording systems with single external cameras, two vehicle computer towers, eight by sky single 8R15 weapons rack EL300, SETCOM intercom systems MS922 with four headsets, 12 Motorola MS2000 radios, one Sony uh, Hi8 solid waste surveillance unit, three Whelan with GT siren controllers, seven EOTech 550 rifle sights, eight Motorola CP200 radios, AB, uh, let's see. ABB HV 12470 7200 LV 1120 240 50 KVA Wagner HV 12470 7200 LV 1220 240 37.5 KVA Wagner HV 12470 7200 LV-120-240, 10 KVA, Howard Industries HV-12470-7200, LV-120-240, 25 KVA, cubicle desk, top uh, shelf overhead storage, two sharp XE-8102, cash <coughs> register, three kiosks, tech, uh, uh, ticket dispensers, model 800 modified, Two bulkhead beams, 36 WF X240 uh, number X 76 feet long, six inches long. Uh, scrap iron, 11,000 to 13,000 pounds. Tech services is one set. 2016 uh, Chevy uh, truck factory number 5589 side mirrors, 11 Jimco uh, sugars dispensers. 22 salt and pepper shakers, a dry erase board 36 by 48. BW gas alert max uh, detector, industry scientific HM X271 gas monitor, three Motorola P110 radios, Theolite 1 not NILD uh, T2000, uh, Home Depot Executive Home Office Chair, Herman Miller Red Office Chair, Folding Chair, <coughs> Office Depot uh, Office Chair, Herman Miller Burgundy Executive Chair, two Herman Miller uh, Partition Panels, two Herman Miller Partition Shelves, and two Herman Miller Partition Desktops. Uh, data Logger Thermo High Tech 150, uh, Emdorf uh, Pipet. Uh, research 1 10 millimeter, uh, uh, stir plate number one, VWR, and last is a John Deere Riding Moore uh, F525. You've heard the resolution, motion to adopt. So moved. Pardon? I have a question. Questions. Uh, I'm following on the, in this uh, diligent. Did we miss a page, page four? 
That one? No, that one? No. Did we read that one? Oh, I did not read that one. I am so sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> did I get through it? All right. Okay. Airport Beacon. Thank you. Airport Beacon, uh, 2004, Ford F-150 XLT, 4x4, four-door, VIN, 1FTPW, 145-14KB83489, 2007, Ford 150, 4x4, four, four four, VIN numbers, 1FTRF, 14WA7KC60395, Kubota, 17-inch motor model, model F2560, hot sea high, high pressure washer on skid MO6544-26, uh, <coughs> C-Rotorque actuator model uh, 1QFM, Mott 8 feet uh, flaw motor, Kubota 6-inch, 60-inch model F2100E motor, uh, mower, uh, Club Cab Riding Mower Model LT1045, Topcon Model GTS to Survey Instrument, Westinghouse HV12470-7200 LV, 120 by 240, 15 kVA electric transformer, and a Brandon and Clark HV7200-12470 LV6900, 167 kVA. Thank you very much. <laughs> You've heard the <coughs> reading of the resolution, motion to adopt. Uh, Jeannie? Second. Second by Chris. <coughs> Please poll the board. Chris Iden, Officer Scott? Yes. Director Ball? Yes. Director Bell? Yes. Director Adams? Yes. Director Bennis? Yes. Director Bowles? Director Christian? Yes. Director Flores? Yes. Director Grant? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Landmore? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Zacanino? Yes. Agenda item number four, <clears throat> discussion and possible action on ratification of contracts by David Collingsworth, Central and Lower Basin Regional Manager, and David Thompson, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, members of the board, can you hear me? Members of the board, this is a, an agenda item to ratify uh, some contracts so that we're consistent with BRA purchasing policies. Uh, at our water and wastewater treatment facilities, we have some commodity style contracts uh, that we don't uh, contract for a, a set dollar amount at the end of a contract. We, we actually purchase on a, a unit cost uh, per pounds for sludge, per tonnage for sludge, or per gallons for, uh, for chemicals at our facilities. And uh, what makes these difficult to budget for is that uh, uh, we're really uh, at the discretion of mother nature uh, on, on how much flow we treat, which determines how much sludge that we have as a byproduct and things like that. So we're, uh, in, in tracking these, we're going to put in performance measures so that we can better do, uh, do a better job of tracking uh, from a budgetary standpoint exactly what's spending. And then also I anticipate uh, in the future these type of commodity style contracts bringing them before the board uh, in July when we do our annual budget updates. So in addition to what, in addition to what David just said, uh, we expanded the review to look at all open contracts. And in so doing, uh, we did, came across two more contracts, same category but different circumstances. And uh, they deal with our resource, uh, no, enterprise resource planning or ERP software and implementation. Now the board back in January of 2014 did approve an ERP implementation software. In that, they named three firms. Now then, after I joined the company in 15, it, it looked as though, 
for the best interest of uh, BRA that we chose to stay with the same software, Lawson. And it happens to be Lawson was also acquired in 2015 by a company called N4. So the software Lawson was installed in 2002. It hadn't had a major upgrade in 10 years. So we had to con construct, uh, had to uh, get consultants in from AVAP to help us install the software and implement it. So we have successfully implemented the financial software. We have a few more pieces of the software to put in, like purchasing and, and whatnot. But it is an oversight on our part that we didn't come back to the board and notify you that we had selected two different firms than what was in the resolution from 2014. So with that, I, any questions about the ratification of the contracts? Seeing none, <clears throat> read your resolution. Okay. Be resolved <clears throat> that the Board of Directors of Brazos River hereby uh, approved the one-time ratification of the following contracts. DPC Industries in the amount of 500,000, Fort Bend Services in the amount of 500,000, DPC Industries in the amount of 750,000, Polydyne in the amount of 3 million, uh, Brentag Southwest in the amount of 1,200, S&M uh, Vacuum in the amount of 1 million, Sprint Waste in the amount of 3 million, Sheridan Environmental in the amount of 3 million, Walker Aerial Environmental in the amount of 3 million 500, N4 Lawson in the amount of 2 million 112,000, and AVAP in the amount of 350,000. Mr. Chairman, just for the record, I believe Paul and I, you said $3 million, and actually listed $1 million. Oh, it's $1 million? I'm, I'm sorry. Very good. My question is, have you gone through all of these uh, contracts, and these are the best prices that we could get? You went through the whole bid process, or how did you do that to we, come up with? We do go through the bidding process on these. These are cost revenue contracts for our operations. Okay. Yeah, we do go out for bid on all the services. Okay. Yes, I was just looking at the amounts are pretty large. Yeah, and these are and, and these are for five years. Uh, we 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 negotiate a cost per tonnage or per gallon, and then we have a, a five year contract where we renew it every year. Okay. And these are these are based upon your best guess estimates for yes. volume. Yes. 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 In, in some circumstances, so we're yes. making sure that we're covered. That's right. And, and yeah. all Sounds these amounts are covered in our budgets. Okay. And in the future, when we have these type of contracts, we're going to come to you and get approval before we do it. So because you only deal on a quarterly basis, we don't find ourselves having a situation where we have more rain or a, a circumstance where we're going to bust this again. Any more questions? You've heard a reading of the resolution. Is there a motion to adopt? Tallis? Second. Johnson? <clears throat> Please poll the board. Presiding Officer Scott? Yes. Director Ball? Yes. Director Bell? Yes. Director Adams? Yes. Director Bennis? Yes. Director Christian? Yes. Director Flores? Yes. Director Grant? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Lamar? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Zaganino? Yes. Agenda item number five, discussion and possible action on amendments to the personal personnel policies by Monica Wheelis, Human Resources Manager. Each year in October, I bring to the board uh, directors of personnel policy changes. And a red line copy of uh, the full changes was included in your diligent materials. But to refresh your memories, I'll briefly go through what we're proposing. Uh, the first proposal is one new policy for diver compensation. And the intent of this policy is to compensate employees for their diver certifications and for performing diving services for the BRA, uh, such as routine maintenance on our structures and also search and recovery operations. We believe that the program will help the BRA retain certified 
divers and recognize and compensate them for their diving skills and abilities. Uh, we have contracted with Evergreen Solutions to conduct a compensation and classification study, and we have tasked them to look into what other entities are, are doing with their divers, how they're compensating them uh, to recognize them for their skills. And uh, we anticipate that they'll bring, um, be able to provide that to us by the end of the year, and we'll bring that back to the board in, in December. Uh, when we discuss the entire uh, compensation study. The next policies are all uh, revisions of policies. The first one is the categories of employment policy. Uh, what we're proposing is the fifth paragraph of this policy be revised to change the basis of the 60-day introductory period for a transitioning employee um, changed to uh, work days rather than calendar days, backwards, calendar days rather than work days, which is consistent with the requirement for employees who are originally hired as full-time employees. We're changing the requirement for transitioning employees, which would include seasonal, part-time, and uh, employees hired in from temporary agencies from 480 hours to complete their introductory period to 340. So that's in line with what we're currently doing with uh, other employees. The sick leave pool policy was completely revised to clarify the purpose of the sick leave pool, eligibility requirements, method for employees to contribute to the pool, and also um, how they can request time to use from the sick leave pool. Uh, we're revising both of the FMLA policies, the FMLA regular policy and then the family uh, military exigency leave policy uh, to provide employees a choice of whether or not to avail themselves of FMLA. And if they do, then they're directed to complete an FMLA request form. And in the other leave, of uh, other leave of absences without pay policy, we're proposing to delete the second to the last paragraph and that states an employee will receive an adjusted date of hire if they request time away from work uh, without pay. And historically, what we've seen is employees who ask for time, uh, leave of absence without pay, generally are doing so to recover from their illness or injury or perhaps an illness or injury of a family member. And uh, we just believe that the mandate to provide them with the new data hire upon return from that leave of absence is, one, difficult to manage from administrative purpose and also uh, a little unfair to the employee who just needed a little bit of extra time. And that's it. Are there any questions? Is there any <clears throat> FMLA provides a 12-week period, and then typically what we see, they may need another couple weeks just to finish, you know, recuperating or so. Uh, we've not had someone be on extended leave of absence that uh, we believe could come back to work. If it looks like they're not able to, then we'll transition them to a long-term disability program. Was there another question? On the... On the diver certification, how long is somebody usually certified as a diver? From my understanding, they can maintain their certifications indefinitely. Um, I don't believe in someone who's smarter in the diver gym indefinitely. Um, the part of the requirement, I believe, and Jimmy might want to speak on this better. Part of the requirement is that you have to have so many dives, and if it's been uh, an extended period of time between dives, then do you have to do something to? Yeah, come on up, Jim. Come up, diver, Jim. Jim, the diver. <laughs> <laughs> Dive certification occurs through a number of different agencies worldwide. Uh, they have different rules. We pattern ours after the Professional Association of Dive Instructors, also known as PADI, P-A-D-I. Uh, if, if a diver hasn't uh, had dive or doesn't have evidence of having dove uh, within a, a, a extended period of time, uh, the agency usually requires that, uh, that diver to be uh, at least observed by a, an instructor 
or a dive master to make sure that they still have the skills and, and, and qualifications to, to, to do that dive. We actually have instructors and dive masters in our employ, so we could do more or less a self-recertification without much problem. So a follow-up question to that. So we're leaving it up to the employee, based on this policy, to tell the BRA if they're still qualified to dive? Yes. It's the employee's responsibility to keep the, the Brazos River Authority um, informed of their diving abilities. And, and, the, and the industry is self-policing as well. There's no requirement for myself, for example, as a diver, to do anything other than show my certification card when I go to dive or get a tank of air. So it's we're not doing anything beyond what the industry requires to begin with. Thank you. Any more questions? <clears throat> Read your resolution, please. Be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby approves the revisions to the Human Resources Policy Manual as presented at its October 30th, 2017 meeting to be effective November 1, 2017. You've heard the resolution and motion to adopt. Hey, Rick. Hubert. Second. We got it here. Uh, please poll the board. President Officer Scott? Yes. Director Ball? Yes. Director Bell? Yes. <coughs> Director Adams? Yes. Director Bennett? Yes. Director Christian? Yes. Director Flores? Yes. Director Grant? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Smith? Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Sacanina? Yes. Agenda item number six, discussion and possible action on medical insurance by Monica Wheelis, Human Resource Manager. It's not very often where I get to stand up in front of you and say I have good news about our medical insurance plan. So I have good news about our medical insurance plan. Uh, this past year, we've experienced a significant reduction in medical claims. And as a result, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, quoted a 10% reduction in our premiums for the 2018 plan year. Let's show the resolution. Uh, this agenda item is requesting authorization for the general manager to execute all documents <coughs> necessary to continue our health plan with Blue Cross Blue Shield. And if there are no questions, I'll read the resolution. Read your resolution. Okay. Whereas the Brazos River Authority has maintained a fully insured medical plan with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas since January 1, 2016, whereas the Brazos River Authority medical plan has experienced a significant reduction in claims expenses, resulting in Blue Cross Blue Shield agreeing to a 10% reduction in premium rates for an approximate savings of $300,000 for the 2018 plan year, and whereas the estimated cost of medical premiums for the 2018 plan year will not exceed $3 million, and funds budgeted for medical premiums in FY 2018 are adequate to pay the medical premiums, as quoted by Blue Cross Blue Shield. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby authorizes the General Manager, CEO, to enter into all agreements necessary to continue the relationship with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas to provide the Brazos River Authority a fully insured medical plan at the rates quoted for the 2018 plan year and within the financial parameters set forth in the 2018 budget. You heard the resolution, motion to adopt. So moved. Uh, Richard, seconded by Cynthia. <coughs> Please poll the board. President Officer Scott? Yes. Director Ball? Yes. Director Bell? Yes. Director Adams? Yes. Director Venice? Yes. Director Christian? Yes. Director Flores? Yes. Director Grant? Yes. <coughs> Director Huber? Yes. 
Director Johnson? Yes. Director Lamar? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Zagnino? Yes. Agenda item number seven, discussion and possible action on the termination of interruptible water available for 2018 by Brad Burnett, Water Service Manager. Good morning, everyone. This is the item that we bring to you every year in October where we ask for your approval for the amount of interruptible water that we're going to make available for the upcoming calendar year. So we're talking about 2018. Uh, just real quick, some background information. Interruptible water is basically unused water that remains in storage in the reservoirs from the previous year. Uh, the board determines annually how much water we're going to make available, how much of that we're going to make available each year, and that determination is made in October at this meeting. It's sold at the same price as our long-term water, so it's system rate or agricultural rate for those users that qualify for the ag rate. And we've been supplying it since about 2008. Um, most of our customers for interruptible water are small agricultural users. Uh, we also have some mining customers that purchase it. And then we have two of our large customers, Gulf Coast Water Authority and Dow, are, are the largest purchasers of interruptible water. And they purchase it essentially to have a backup supply to their own water rights and their, their other long-term BRA contracts. We have a uh, procedure that outlines all the pertinent details with regard to our interruptible water sales, including the calculation methodology, the application process, and the allocation process. That allocation methodology includes a safety factor that's established annually by the board when we make the availability determination. And the purpose of that safety factor is to make sure that our interruptible water sales don't impact our long-term customers. So we've historically been very conservative with that. We've used a factor of 0.25 every year since we began supplying interruptible water back in 2008. And that essentially provides a 75% factor of safety because basically the way the calculation works is we determine how much unused water there was last year and then we multiply it by 0.25. So we're only taking 25% of it to make available. All of our contracts contain a provision that allows us to suspend water use under those contracts if we reach a stage three drought trigger level in our drought contingency plan. So they're interruptible contracts in that we can curtail use in the middle of a year if we need to. Uh, Multi-year contracts get first priority on the water that's made available. As some of you may remember that in the past we've issued interruptible contracts for terms of up to five years in length. Those contracts don't automatically guarantee that that entity will get to use the water every year. They're still subject to the availability determination that the board makes in October, but it puts them in line ahead of the new request. So the water that is made available first goes to meet all those contracts that we currently have in place for 2018. And then if we have leftover, it goes for new contracts with, with new requests. Um, we have made some changes to our procedures this year, and one of the changes involves those long-term or those multi-year contracts. Going forward, forward, we're no longer going to be offering those. And what we found is really since 2011, but, but more so in the last few years, more and more of our interruptible water is getting tied up in long-term contracts each year, which leaves very little left for the new requests that come in. And when we end up at the end of the process and we meet all of those long-term contracts, the amount of water that we have for the new requests is small and we have to go through a complicated pro rata process to allocate that water. And so. Uh, we're hopeful that, that ending the multi-year contracts will help take care of that. And another major change that we're making is uh, we're, we're giving priority to requests of 1,000 acre feet and less moving forward. And so the way that will work is that we currently have multi-year contracts that have been written in the past. And so those are going to be with us, some of them up to 2021, because entities that contracted for five years last year, their contract is still going to be in place until 2021. So we'll honor those contracts until they expire. But after we meet the needs of those multi-year contracts, whatever remainder we have left will be used to meet the needs of the smaller requests of 1,000 acre feet and less. And when you look at our interruptible water portfolio, I'd say 95% of our customers request less than 1,000 acre feet, and some of them significantly, more, uh, significantly less than that. And so we're able to essentially meet all of their needs off the top and still have a substantial amount of the water remaining for the larger users. And again, you know, we, we, we may have four or five users that request over 1,000, uh, Gulf Coast Water Authority and Dow, and then a handful of others. So 
those are some changes that we've made this year and we're hoping it'll it'll simplify the process moving forward uh, we did notify all of our customers back in the spring that we were proposing to make those changes uh, all of our current interruptible customers as well as all the interruptible customers that we've had within the last five years uh, we let them know what we were proposing and, and provided them an opportunity to comment as well as posted the changes on the internet on our website and we didn't actually receive any comments whatsoever on the changes so this is just a, a graphic that shows our sales since 2008. The gray bar is the amount that's been authorized by the board each year. The blue bar is the amount that was actually contracted for by our customers. And then the green is the amount that actually got used during that year. 2011 was really a game changer in terms of the drought that year. Uh, prior to 2011, we had never sold anywhere close to all the interruptible water that the, the board made available or the, the predecessor to interruptible water was what we'd called one-year water and we never sold all of that either what would happen would be prior to 2011 a lot of our customers wouldn't buy the water until they needed it and some of them would buy it in like monthly or two-week increments in the summer so if they needed it in July they would buy a little and if it stayed dry they would buy a little bit more but 2011 kind of changed the game due to the, the severity of that drought and it kind of created a little bit of a, a fear mentality amongst the customers that if they didn't get the water somebody else was going to get it and so ever since then, uh, for the most part, we, we've sold almost all of it every year, even though uh, most years, not much of it gets used. When you look at the green bars there, only three out of the last 10 years has, has over 10,000 acre feet of it actually been used. And that's primarily due, due to the fact that, again, our two largest customers are Dow and Gulf Coast Water Authority. They have their own water rights that in most years are sufficient for them to meet all their needs from just the flow in the river. Uh, so they buy water from us essentially as insurance or backup water when we do have those really dry years. And so uh, that's why, you know, you see so much of it under contract, but so little of it getting used. It's only in those really dry years that, that the large users need theirs. This shows a, a little bit about who our customers are currently and more detail on which contracts expire and which ones carry over into next year. We have a total in 2017 of about 88,528 acre feet under contract. 73% uh, of that is with Dow and Gulf Coast Water Authority. You can see their contracts listed at the top. And then we have 71 other contracts for the other 27% or, or roughly 23,500. We have 82,374 acre feet of water that's in those multi-year contracts that will extend through 2018 or beyond. And so these contracts, again, will get first shot at the water that we make available and the remainder will be offered on a prorated basis to the new requests that we've received this year. This slide shows how the numbers fall out that result from our calculations. The numbers uh, for the interruptible water amounts that we're recommending be made available in, are in the second column there. They vary by location, so obviously we have to take into account where the water is relative to where our customers' requests are coming from. Uh, in, the two, in total, the 2018 calculation equals 86,280 acre feet, and that's what our recommendation is to you. The middle column shows the amount of that water that's under contract with customers that have those multi-year contracts that are already in place through 2018, and so we'll meet those requests off the top with the water that's made available. And then the last column shows the remainder. Uh, 3,906 acre feet is all that we have available for the new requests that we've received this year. And so we'll go through the process of allocating that water to those new requests, giving priority to the 1,000 acre feet requests and less. I think that's all I have. I'll be happy to answer any questions for you. And I have a resolution for you as well. Seeing. Uh, does the does the water master uh, review this or have any oversight or input on this? Kind they, of the water master doesn't review our, our contracting decisions, but they do review our, our water use and they they enforce our water use on a daily basis. So, you know, once we contract for this water, we notify the water master that these contracts are now in place, and so all of these customers that are diverting water, uh, we're having to constantly report to the water master what their plans are and how much they've diverted. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Are those two Dow uh, contracts, are those new or is that an old, old contract? Uh, they're old. I think they, uh, they entered a, a one new contract last year and they may have had another contract prior to that. So uh, they were 2016 and prior uh, whenever those were entered. Okay. 
Yes, sir. Any more questions? You'll read your resolution. Okay. Be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby approves a safety factor of 0.25 for use in determining the amounts of interruptible water to make available in calendar year 2018. Be it further resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby authorizes the General Manager slash CEO to make up to 86,280 acre-feet of interruptible water available in calendar year 2018. Be it further resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby authorizes the General Manager slash CEO to use up to 82,374 acre-feet of the interruptible water made available for calendar year 2018 to supply existing interruptible water availability agreements and to enter into new interruptible water availability agreements for up to 3,906 acre feet, which shall be sold at the current system rate per acre foot, except for water for agricultural use, as that term is defined in Chapter 11 of the Texas Water Code, which shall be sold at the current agricultural rate. You heard the resolution. Is there a motion to adopt? Jeannie, second, Robert. <clears throat> Please poll the board. Presiding Officer Scott? Yes. Director Ball? Yes. Director Bell? Yes. Director Adams? Yes. Director Venice? Yes. Director Christian? Yes. Director Flores? Yes. Director Grant? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Towers? Yes. <coughs> Director Taylor? Yes. Director Zanfina? Yes. Agenda item number eight, discussion and possible action on interlocal agreement amendment between Brazos River Authority, City of Abilene, and West Central West Central Texas Municipal Water District by Michael McClendon, Upper Basin Regional Manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I wanted to update you on a uh, interlocal agreement that we originally executed in 2005. Uh, it was subsequently amended in 2015. And then afterwards, I'll request the board's authorization to move forward with a second amendment to that interlocal <coughs> with the involved parties. Those involved parties include uh, the Brazos River Authority, City of Abilene, and the West Central Texas Municipal Water District. Uh, in 2005, the parties executed uh, an interlocal agreement to address respective water right interest. Uh, the BRA had filed its system operation permit in 2004. Uh, Abilene and District were pursuing Cedar Ridge Reservoir and some other water supply projects. So uh, in 2015, uh, some of the terms of that original agreement that we executed in 05 were beginning to mature. And uh, it, it wasn't contemplated that it was take so long to obtain the uh, system operations permit, so we needed to make some changes in 2015. Uh, one of the initial considerations of that original agreement required option payments by the district and by the city that needed to be addressed uh, for 20,000 acre foot of water that was held. Uh, likewise, there was also some concern about some of the language in that uh, initial interlocal agreement that needed to be addressed. <coughs> so that 2015 amendment clarified any ambiguities that were in that uh, original agreement. And it also, it clearly defined when payments would need to occur uh, and how much water would be available. So the proposed amendment that I'm bringing forward today uh, is to reduce that amount, that 20,000 acre feet of water <coughs> that the city of Abilene and the district have available to them uh, to 12,800 acre feet. And this is possible because uh, the city is uh, intent on executing a 7,200 acre foot uh, system water availability agreement with the Brazos River Authority. You might be wondering uh, how we're able to contract for long-term water at this junction for that 7,200 acre foot. Uh, this is water that Luminant, and I'm bringing in another party here, uh, but uh, Luminant was by contract allowed uh, to assign their water uh, to another party. And they were working closely with the city of Abilene. Abilene had gone through the drought. They were looking for additional water supplies. Luminant had that water available. Uh, however, Luminant's contract with the Brazos River Authority was getting ready to uh, terminate. And so all the parties got together and said, and Luminant didn't want quite as much water uh, as what they had contracted for in the past. 
So all the parties got together and said it would be less confusing when uh, attorneys and folks read contracts in the future that if Luminant simply gave that water back to the Brazos River Authority, in turn, uh, the BRA would uh, offer that through an agreement uh, with the city of Abilene. And so that's what's transpired. Simply what we're doing with this second amendment is just memorializing <coughs> the reduction of that 20,000 acre foot of water by 7,200 acre foot. And it's consistent with the intent and the considerations of the original agreement and also the interlocal. And I, I take any questions that you might have. Uh, I do have a resolution. Yes, sir. Uh, trying to get back. This is going to be used by consumers in, in Abilene. Yes, sir. Like how many people this, you know, like a family of four uses how many acre feet and what length of time? I couldn't answer that off the top of my head. Uh, uh, the city of Abilene, uh, during the 2011 drought, found themselves in uh, dire circumstances. They almost uh, ran out of water to supply. I mean, it was getting close that where they almost ran out of water out of uh, their reservoirs, out of Hubbard Creek Reservoir. One of the things that the city did do is, uh, and we brought this to the board in the past, is our West Central Texas Municipal, or our West Central Brazos Pipeline. Uh, they purchased that pipeline from the Brazos River I Authority. I remember that. No, right. I, and I, I'm just trying to get a perspective of like, how many people are in Abilene and, and how much do they use in a year? It's just part of being able to, you know, calculate acre feet to, to when it's being used by people as opposed to uh, commercial customers. Okay. Yeah, I don't know in total what Abilene's demands are off the top of my head, but like your example, a family of four uh, would be about a half an acre foot per year. Um, you know, a, rough, a, a good rough number to use is 100 gallons per person, so 400 gallons a day times 365, somewhere close to a half an acre foot I see you year. got the calculator in your hand. <laughs> <laughs> About a half an acre foot for a family of four. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, that's, that's more. I will tell you, this would be this water uh, that's been sold out of Possum Kingdom would be one of the last resorts that they would utilize. It's probably their most expensive source of water because of the treatment, uh, the high chlorides. Uh, so it'd be one of the last mm -hmm. uses. Plus, it's got to be conveyed all the way from Possum Kingdom through uh, a pipeline. Yeah. Well, yes, sir. Right. Okay. Yes, sir. You, you started in to talk about the question that I've got. Luminant, Luminant would be taking the water out of one point in the system and Abilene would be pulling it from another. How does that affect our general operating plan as far as water availability? It, it's actually from the same system. I don't know if Brad wants to expand on that, but we look at uh, Possum Kingdom, Granbury, and Whitney as one system. And that's the bucket of water that it would be taken out of. Yeah, Luminance contracts, uh, when they were written years ago, part of them were written against Granbury and part of them were written against Possum Kingdom. So the sources of water for Abilene will be diverted out of Possum Kingdom and that was originally where uh, a lot of the water that Luminant had under contract with us was permitted or was contracted for as well. So, so for my simple-minded thinking, it's not any different. We're not really changing the allocation of water resources. It was already there. Right. Is that right? It was there and it was contracted originally to Luminant and now the 7200 will be contracted to Admiral. Okay. Thank you very much. Any additional questions? Read your resolution, please. Whereas the Brazos River Authority, City of Abilene, and the West Central Texas Municipal Water District executed an interlocal agreement in 2005 to address respective water rights and water right applications and whereas the Brazos River Authority, City of Abilene, and the West Central Texas Municipal Water District executed an amendment to interlocal agreement to address specific conditions and clarify provisions within the 2005 interlocal agreement, and whereas the Brazos River Authority, City of Abilene, and the West Central Texas Municipal Water District desire to effectuate specified terms of the 2005 interlocal agreement and to reflect the party's endeavors, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby authorizes the General Manager, CEO, to execute the Second Amendment to Interlocal Agreement with the City of Abilene and the West Central Texas Municipal Water District. You heard a reading of the resolution. Motion to adopt. Sal. Second. Second. Please poll the board. Madam Officer Scott. Yes. Director Ball. Yes. Director Bell. Yes. Director Adams? <coughs> yes. Sorry. 
Director Bennis? Yes. Director Bennett? Yes. Director Flores? Yes. Director Grant? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Zakanina? Yes. And item number nine. <clears throat> Discussion and possible action on Salt Creek, Graham, Texas project by Michael McLennan, Upper Basin Regional Manager. Thank you again. Uh, kind of like Monica, uh, she was excited to give you some good news, and I'm excited as well with uh, this presentation. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's been a long time, uh, but uh, as uh, you may recall, back in July, we advised the board that we had finally reached resolution with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, on our Graham Salt Creek project. And so I wanted to provide a, a brief update uh, to the board. Quick history. Uh, uh, in 2012, we began discussions with the uh, city of Graham and uh, the Corps of Engineers on how to uh, move this project forward. Uh, it was kind of stagnant and it was stalling. Uh, that endeavor resulted in uh, the Corps of Engineers providing the BRA several options. Uh, we came back to the board in 2012, presented those options to the board, and the board approved the general manager uh, the authorization to execute an agreement with uh, the Corps of Engineers and the city. Uh, we had multiple meetings with the Corps of Engineers and the city to try to develop that agreement. Soon it became evident that those endeavors, uh, that the Corps was not going to follow through. So in 2016, uh, we sought the authorization of the uh, project and we were successful in December of 2016. Uh, so where are we at now? Where does that leave us now that uh, we've deauthorized the project? Uh, one component of the project was to remove uh, the individuals out of the 10-year floodplain. And uh, we've successfully done that. The individuals are out of the 10-year floodplain. And we've, we've also uh, demoed the associated structures. Uh, the BRA has an inundation easement over the properties within the 10-year floodplain. So we're able to... Uh, <coughs> Uh, it either temporarily uh, inundate those waters if, if necessary. There is a small area uh, that the city owned property. They have a, a cell barn and uh, some baseball fields that we do not have an inundation over, inundation easement over at this juncture. This uh, agreement would allow, would provide the BRA a inundation easement uh, if it's executed, if and when. Uh, in addition, uh, we do not budget any funding uh, this fiscal year. Uh, in 2012, when the Corps provided its options to us, we were uh, anticipated moving forward at that time. However, uh, as I said, there were multiple delays. So FY18, I did not budget any funds. I just want, I'd wait, I wanted to wait until it materialized and I would come back and request authorization for the, from the board to move forward. Also, we wanted to be more prudent in our budgeting process. Each year we were budgeting $1.4 million and it wasn't getting spent. Um, so the next steps is really to seek authorization from the board to proceed forward with execution of an agreement between the Brazos River Authority and the city. Essentially, it would be a reconfirmation of an agreement, but without the Corps of Engineers. So I do, I do have a resolution for your consideration. It provides, as I stated, uh, the authorization of the general manager to execute an agreement. Uh, it also provides $1.4 million uh, amendment to the FY18 budget. $1.3 million would be conveyed to the city uh, consistent with the terms of that agreement. The city would take over some of the uh, requirements that the BRA had uh, to provide recreational improvements, and then it would also help for the O&M uh, cost associated that the city will maintain that property from here on out. And then there's uh, $100,000 in there for direct labor cost. Uh, we've had to mow that property. Uh, there's been a lot of illegal dumping. We've had to remove a lot of trash. And so I've got some costs that I want to uh, capture that was unanticipated. Yes, ma'am. I got a little confused. You said there was still some areas on there that had some baseball or some, some kind of recreation. Yes, ma'am. And, yeah. and it could be inundated in the flood? Yes, ma'am. It, it's okay. like a lot of municipalities they take uh -huh. those type of areas and place baseball fields on or unfortunately sometimes you see water waste but our there. agreement covers us if if there should be an inundation there yes and we don't have any 
the liability for right. those fields that's, that's or any issue. future fields they want to build in that area. Correct. Is that, is we'll, that correct? Yes, we'll have a inundation easement over the whole project area. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And does that happen very often? Uh, yes, ma'am. There was a floods in 78, 2005, 1990. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's a 10-year floodplain, and you, you've heard a lot with Harvey about 800 years. So yes. obviously yeah. it's going to occur a lot yeah. more. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to be clear what, what we were covering, so yes, that, that's good. Yeah, that's the, our, our biggest issue here is uh, reducing that liability. Yes, okay. sir. Mike, as I understand it, this closes out our financial obligations now on this project. We're through with it. No more money, so forth. Yes, sir. That's why I said it was good news. Uh, okay. Originally, uh, the, the Corps of Engineers budget for this was, uh, when they came to us, it was $4.2 million. The, uh, when they came to us in 2011, what prompted that, they, it had gone up to $6.5 million. And so that's when we went back and said, hey, uh, that would have only gotten us through phase one of a three-phase project. So looking, for, looking at it now, uh, our costs to date are, if you include the 1.3 million that we pay for the recreation and the O&M to the city, it's $6.3 million. And so uh, we're actually under what they projected just for one additional year. And the Corps was gonna continue to keep escalating that cost over time. But the biggest problem that we had, as uh, Director Johnson pointed out, was the delays. Every time you delay, every day you could have a flood, and then you'd have uh, extreme liability associated with that. Any more questions? <clears throat> Read your resolution, please. Yes, sir. Be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby authorizes the General Manager, CEO, to enter into any and all contracts and or agreements to provide resolution to the Salt Creek Graham, Texas project. And be it further resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby authorizes and approves amending the fiscal year 2018 Graham Flood Control Capital Improvement Project budget to $1.4 million. You heard the resolution of the motion to adopt. So moved. Richard. Second. Second by, uh, who is that? John Henry. John Henry. <clears throat> Please poll the board. President Officer Scott? Yes. Director Ball? Yes. Director Bell? Yes. Director Adams? Yes. Director Bennis? Yes. Director Christian? Yes. Director Flores? Yes. Director Grant? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. <clears throat> Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Tallis? Uh, Director Taylor? Yes. Director Sacanino? Yes. Agenda item number 10, discussion and possible action on pier plate wall assessment at Morris Shepherd Dam by Michael McClendon, Upper Basin Regional Manager. Thank you, sir. This is my last presentation. In the uh, early 70s, uh, the Brazos River Authority hired a contractor to perform some maintenance activity on our spillway gates, uh, and specifically uh, our pier plate walls at Moore Shepherd Dam. Instead of replacing the deteriorated uh, pier, the existing pier plates uh, with new metal plates, uh, were just simply welded over the existing ones. Uh, recently, uh, those Pier plates have uh, begun to bow out or protrude, and they've caused excessive damage and or excessive leakage and some damage to our side seals on those gates. As you're aware, the board uh, we began uh, providing maintenance uh, work up at Possum Kingdom through our RSMU group, our Reservoir System Maintenance Unit, uh, in 1990. Uh, knowing that these pier plate walls needed to be replaced, we budgeted accordingly. However, uh, once we got in there, started working, removing some of these uh, pier plate walls, we noticed that uh, it was gonna be more comprehensive uh, and it was gonna require a structural engineer to come in and design the re remediative repair. Uh, the intent of this presentation today is really twofold. Uh, first, it's to illustrate the work that's being performed uh, up there at Moore Shepherd Dam. And then secondly, it's uh, to provide the board sufficient information for us to move forward uh, and hire a engineer to develop this uh, engineering design. Uh, 
Uh, our RSMU group uh, is going to be performing the maintenance work. We're, we're using our folks because uh, of the quality of work that they produce, the skill level uh, that they've obtained up there, and then knowing that it's going to be done correctly. In the end, um, it's going to ensure, using our RSMU group, it'll ensure that the project's done timely, uh, the costs will be reduced, and very important to me is uh, the fact that uh, a lot of the uh, construction contractor challenges that we faced at several other projects, I think will be alleviated, alleviated uh, by using our own folks. I'm going to walk you through, uh, kind of attempt to illustrate what's being performed uh, uh, up here at the uh, Moore Shepherd Dam. Uh, the photo on the left shows you simply where the overall picture of where everything's going to occur, where all the construction activity is going to uh, require work on all nine existing gates. Uh, the photograph over here on the right, uh, this is a little bit more, I guess, a close-up view. Uh, this is where the pier plate walls are located right here. Uh, you've got the existing gate. It's in the down structure. Uh, and so whenever you have any kind of, uh, when that gate, there's seals, whenever there's any kind of protrusion on that uh, wall, that seal is getting torn up. So, so that's what we're going in here and having to fix. Uh, so. To do that, we go in and we install a bulkhead beam, the bulkheads, that just provides a dry working environment for our group. Uh, we lower the gate. This is the gate right here in the lowered position. And then they'll go in and, and then we'll start uh, removing the pier plate walls and uh, some of the concrete. My next slide kind of gives you a, a better idea of what we're doing. Uh, so this is a close-up uh, picture. You can see that's the pier plate wall. That's where that gate is sliding uh, up against that steel. That uh, steel has to be removed. And what I've got here on the right is a video of one of our RSMU group or, uh, gentlemen uh, using art gouging to remove that. It's about a 13-second video. Uh, So it, it takes a significant amount of time to go in there. It's going to take several weeks. You've got uh, an outer shell, the existing pier plate wall, uh, and then you've got an interior uh, piece of metal that you've got to cut out. And then what we've got, you can see right here, is uh, the metal pier plates have been removed here. Uh, so that's been cut off. But then you've got to go in here, and you've got to remove this concrete. So we've got to go into that concrete. We've got to saw cut it, chip it away. And then right here are embedded metal backer bars that those pier plates were welded against. So then we've got to go in there and remove that as well. So you've got to cut that out with art gouging or plasma cutting. So it's a pretty intensive process. So going through this project, uh, we knew that we're going to have to remove the old pier plate walls and then replace it with new pier plate walls. Whenever we went in there and we started removing that material and discovered that the um, anchor bolts extended all the way through that pier, if I go back, so you'd have a bolt here and it would extend all the way through and attached on the other side of the adjacent gate. Whenever we discovered that that was the case, we knew that we needed to call in somebody else. It wasn't shown on the as-built drawings, so we needed to call in somebody else to come in and design the remediative repair. Um, we went out for proposals. Three firms responded to our RFP. We're coming to you today to recommend that we hire Gannett Fleming, Inc. Uh, we're not recommending an increase to the budget. Uh, we think that we can cover the cost associated with this through our operations budget, through savings uh, from non-spent funds for some other projects that have actually come in under, under budget a little bit. Uh, the $400,000 estimate that you see here is an estimate at this juncture. This project's going to span multiple years. So any, every time we move to a different gate, the engineer is going to have to come back out to the site, look at it, and perform an assessment and tell us that that design repair is the appropriate design repair. It probably will be very similar because all the gates are exactly the same, but you never know about unknowns. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've developed some uh, budget protections within the uh, resolution here and subsequent board approvals if required. I can answer any questions that you might have. I do have a resolution. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike, I'm highly supportive of using our own people, but uh, if I understand right, Gannett Fleming is going to be responsible for inspecting the work we do and certifying it as being correct and 
appropriate. That, that is correct, yes. And that, that's part of the cost in there. They'll come out, prepare the design, and then they'll come back out whenever we start performing work and look and make sure that, yes, it's done correctly. And they'll do it each time we move to a different gate. So it'll. this resolution is for five years. It'll be a lot longer than five years for so all this. Okay, that's good. So in, in doing the work ourselves, where is the liability going to lay if it's if it's improperly done? Is that going to lay with Gannett Fleming, or is that going to be our problem? We really, this is not that. I don't want to say it's not that difficult, but uh, we we currently replace all the existing gate, all the metal that you see there. We replace all that currently, so the risk would not be any greater. There is there is protections built in our contracts for liability associated with the design. And you know, Laura Lee could expand upon that, but uh, we have those protections built in our contracts. So this really isn't anything unusual that we're doing. No, not at all. Okay, they're very familiar with the process. It's not like we're jumping out and doing something we're not aware of. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any additional questions? Seeing none, read your resolution, please. Yes, sir. The following resolution is pre presented for consideration of the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority for adoption at its October 30th, 2017 meeting. Be resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby authorizes and approves the General Manager, CEO, to enter and execute a contract with Gannett Fleming Inc. to perform engineering and construction oversight services to meet operational maintenance objectives at Moore Shepherd Dam in an amount not to exceed $400,000 for a five-year period subject to annual budget approvals. You've heard the resolution, a motion to adopt. John Henry and uh, yeah, Jim Lattimore, second. Please pull the board. First item, Officer Scott. Yes. Director Ball. Director Bell. Yes. Director Adams. Yes. Director Bennis. Yes. Director Christian. Yes. Director Flores. Yes. Director Grant. Yes. Director Huber. Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Lloyd? Uh, Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Towers? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Zaganina? Yes. Item number 11. Discussion and possible action on House Bill 1437, interlocal agreement by David Collingsworth, Central and Lower Basin Regional Manager. Members of the board, this is probably one of the most unique water contracts uh, that the BRA is a part of. It may be one of the most unique water contracts in the state of Texas. Uh, and it's something, and I'm going to stay on a 30,000 foot level today, but it's something that probably over the next uh, year to year and a half you're going to uh, spend a lot more time, we'll spend a lot more time with you discussing because we're at a, uh, a point of action now of moving forward rather rapidly. Uh, House Bill 1437 was negotiated back in the 90s and it was uh, a way to provide an interbasin transfer of 25,000 acre feet of water from Lake Travis uh, into areas of Williamson County uh, for cities that didn't have that their ETJ was not in both basins. Uh, and if I were to back out and show you the Brazos Basin as a whole, it would be pretty easy to see that the, the western parts of Williamson County really are an <coughs> island, if you will, and, and just about as far away from the main stem of the Brazos as you can get. So it kind of made sense back then uh, to, to figure out how to get water from here uh, to the Liberty Hill area uh, and, and also uh, uh, other areas here in, in Williamson County. House Bill 1437 is pretty clear. The intent is to allow 25,000 acre feet of water to come into the Brazos Basin. It also specifically says that for every drop of water that leaves the Colorado Basin, a drop of water has to be returned or some mechanism has to be put in place uh, for the Brazos River Authority to fund water projects in the Colorado River, uh, in, the, in the Colorado Basin. So a few years ago, the, the Brazos River Authority in the city of Round Rock decided that it was in our best interest uh, to begin to evaluate process 
processes for taking water out of Travis into the basin and then back into the Colorado so that we could kind of control our own destiny. The House bill allows the LCRA to create an agricultural, an, agri an ag committee, if you will, and that ag committee gets to recommend to the LCRA's board projects or processes uh, to recoup that no net loss. Uh, and we don't want that to happen. We want to be the, uh, the driver of our own destiny. We want to control our own cost. Instead of paying for uh, reservoirs downstream in the Colorado Basin, we want to try to put something in place, uh, again, to control our own cost. So we started years ago, a couple of years ago, looking at uh, different, probably 40 different projects uh, return, to return water back to the Colorado Basin, including groundwater, surface water, uh, uh, buying well fields, all, all types of projects. Uh, and where we are now is looking at taking effluent uh, from Brushy Creek, uh, and that's water, a lot of that water is generated, will be generated from Lake Travis uh, into Round Rock, into Liberty Hill, uh, and taking that water in various phases and stages and returning it back to the Colorado Basin. The, the, the point that we're at now is that the city of Round Rock, uh, it, they're developing the plans to expand that wastewater treatment plant. So LCRA and BRA and Round Rock need to sit at the table uh, and look at the preliminary design for that facility. So if we're going to use that effluent uh, to return that water back into the basin, uh, we can evaluate how that would work, what it would cost, what are the timing, uh, what are the timing constraints, stuff like that. So what we're asking for today is an interlocal agreement for those three agencies uh, to begin discussions and studies, engineering and design of what that facility would look like to, to return the effluent back into the Colorado Basin. There are benefits to the BRA for this because it appears to be probably the most cost-effective solution into returning water. Uh, also, there, the benefits to the LCRA are that uh, some of this water in Cedar Park and Leander is uh, because of their ETJ, their water service area is also in the Colorado. Uh, that doesn't count toward the HB 1437 requirement, but it incentivizes LCRA to to want to be a part of this solution uh, because it will allow them to uh, maybe take more than the 25,000 acre feet of water. It, it will allow them a cost effective way to get some of their water back in their basin. So again, I, I think over the next six months to a year, we'll be having uh, uh, more discussions with the board on where this is going. Uh, we have some money in the budget next year for some preliminary studies. It's, it's not the type of money that we're looking at. Uh, this has kind of moved forward faster than we thought, so we need to sit down with LCRA and Round Rock and figure out where we're going, and then we'll be back to the board sometime in the spring to talk about more detailed plans. Any questions? Yes, sir. How much of the infrastructure is there now, and how much will be needed to be built to complete this loop? Uh, a, a significant portion of the infrastructure is there now. The Brushy Creek Regional Wastewater System already has reuse capabilities, and it's just a matter of figuring out how you would size that. Uh, and then, Leroy, we would have to figure out what what facilities, being pipelines and maybe lift stations, would be needing would be needed to get it to. Uh, the Colorado Basin. Right. And then LCRA's part is figuring out what piping they're going to need and where they're going to take the water and what they're going to do with it also. It's not as simple as just discharging it uh, into either one of these receiving streams, right. receiving streams because of permitting issues and phosphorus loading. So, so we're getting 25,000 acre feet out of Lake Travis. Does this and we've got a return. Does this return the total of the 25,000? Are we going to have to put more water with it? Well, at least for the early years, at least probably for the next 10 to 20 years, that water won't have to be subsidized. There are years beyond that where we could find ourselves in a situation where we had extremely low flows in the Brazos and we were having to subsidize some BRA water for that. Uh, but that's, that's years down the road. Right now, we're just looking at, for the next 10 years, returning 3,000 acre feet of water. Uh, so I, I don't think that becomes an issue until we get out somewhere beyond 20,000 acre feet. Any other? Leroy, did I answer your question? Yeah. OK. And you're in the, we're, we're being asked to authorize execution of the contract? or just No, you're, you're just, we're, what we're asking for is, 
uh, anytime the VRA has an interlocal agreement, that has to be approved by our board. So we're, I'm not asking you to authorize money. I'm asking you to authorize the vehicle uh, so that I can come back to you in the future uh, for, for money. But we're asking for the approval of an interlocal agreement uh, for the GM to execute, negotiate and execute that document between the three agencies, VRA, LCRA, and City of Round Rock. But then it comes back to us for approval after that? Is that what you're saying? No, that, that document wouldn't. For us to spend any more money than we have in our budget, which is $100,000, we would have to bring that back to the board. That's another big picture question. Now, now Round Rock, we're, we're selling them 18,000 feet. This was in 16 out of Lake Georgetown, but that includes like when we pump from lake to lake to lake to get it there, but it finally comes out of Georgetown. So the 18,000 acre feet, that's the total BRA money they're getting. That's the I total mean, BRA water. Money. Yes, sir. And then the, the 25, just to keep the 25,000 uh, is coming out of Lake Trap, but it has to be returned. That's right. Okay. That's right. So, yeah. I mean, this is one of the, like when you look long term and you're thinking, uh, what's the challenge that, well, intermediate term, this is a big one, is it not, because of the population growth there and how far they are from our sources of water? That's it, exactly. And the benefit to Round Rock is that it, it provides them two different water supplies, so it allows them to be a little bit more drought tolerant than some of our other customers. Yeah, but yeah. you can't just haul the water over that little red line and dump it then. You gotta. I wish it were that easy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it yeah seems we looked like at that as an option and TCQ said no. Oh, okay. <laughs> We are we're in a long term contract with LCRA and, for that water now. And we will be for uh, until you find another your source. Contract. Yeah. So it's because you it's under a, a legislation. That's right. And that's the reason they we all need to understand why why we have to keep taking that water. And it's expensive water. Expensive uh, water we have to take and we have to make sure we return. So right now, right now, that water is charged to BRA, and we roll that to our customers uh, for the most part. Uh, an LCRA rate plus an HB 1437 surcharge that the LCRA board gets to <coughs> determine. And right now, that surcharge just happens to be 25%. So the reservation rate on that water is $90, roughly. Uh, so it would double if anybody starts using that water. Currently, Round Rock is not using that water. Uh, it'll be a couple of years before they start using that water. Or, or that could change. I mean, it just depends on, uh, that's their projections to us right now. So. David, I, I'm confused maybe. And we can transfer water to them and they could transfer water to us. Is See, it's not They easy. transfer water to us. Right. And then it is our responsibility to find some mechanism to either fund a project to replace that water or find a project that they can agree to where we're actually physically moving water across the basin. Okay. okay. And, and that is what we want to do because we think this effluent out of this wastewater treatment plant right here will be a cheaper solution than going downstream and, and funding 25,000 acre feet of a reservoir or another type yeah. of project. Okay. Okay. The limitations with, with what we talked about a minute ago is you just can't dump that water because of nutrient loading and dissolved oxygen and other permitting issues in that basin. Could, uh, yes, we get in a situation where we were just providing them water out of the out of our basin? Uh, no, sir, not likely, uh, because system operation permits probably not going to provide enough water uh, up and down the I-35 corridor for the future of Round Rock to be able to go fully supported for the BRA's water. Uh, if, if in the future groundwater was coming into uh, from the Carrizo into Williamson County, that may be an option, uh, but that's that's pretty far down the road. <laughs> David, how does the water physically get from Travis to Cedar Park or Leander? Is there a pipeline or? A there, uh, we we actually operate uh, Sandy Creek Wake Water Treatment Plant, which is up here in Sandy Creek. Uh, so now that water is being pumped uh, into uh, Cedar Park and Leander, and then there's another floating barge that will. Uh, provide water to the new VCRUA, Brushy Creek Regional Utility Water Treatment Plant uh, that supplies all three of these and that's how Round Rock will physically uh, take their water. Uh, there are some consulting engineers now that are looking at uh, design of a, a deep water intake. You may have read about the uh, intake near Valente uh, in the Austin Statesman years ago so that's 
that's the, the long-term goals are for a, a, a very large deep water intake that will move and pipe that water into, into those customers. Right now, it's done all by floating barge. Hmm. Other questions? This is, again, to, to, to expand upon what Director Johnson was talking about. This was uh, legislative uh, stuff that happened back in the 90s. Uh, a lot of the terms of the agreement and the contracts were decided on in the 99-2000 time frame. So uh, this is something that we've, we've had to deal with from, from years and years and years ago. Okay. Resolution? Read your resolution. Uh, be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby authorizes the General Manager CEO to negotiate and execute an interlocal agreement with the Lower Colorado River Authority and the City of Round Rock for the cost sharing of House Bill 1437 no net loss studies. Heard the resolution and motion to adopt. So moved. Chris, second by Johnson. Please poll the board. President Officer Scott? Yes. Director Ball? Yes. Director Bell? Yes. Director Adams? Yes. Director Venice? Yes. Director Christian? Yes. Director Flores? Yes. Director Grant? Yes. Director Hewer? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Lymore? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Zacanina? Yes. Agenda item number 12. Discussion and possible action on East Williamson County Water Treatment Plant Production Well Pipeline by Trey Busby, Central and Lower Basin Regional Customer Relations Business Manager. Chairman. <coughs> Chairman, thank you very much, board members, thank you. Today I have an action item requesting board authorization for the general manager CEO to execute a construction contract for the East Clemson County production well pipeline in an amount not to exceed $700,000. This expenditure was previously approved in your FY 2018 budget. Typically we come to the board with a, uh, when we advertise construction projects and come to the board with a request to approve selection of a construction firm based on the bids received. However, our well drilling contractor's most recent schedule is three months ahead, ahead of schedule, which now requires the pipeline construction bids to be open sometime after today's board meeting and a pipeline construction to begin sometime before the January 2018 board meeting. If the well contractor is successful with the proposed schedule adjustment and the pipeline is not available for testing of the permanent well pump, the well, the well contractor may uh, end up claiming uh, delay costs against the BRA. This is an overview of the uh, project site. This is the East Winston County Water Treatment Facility. Here's our production well location and here's the raw water pipeline that we're talking about today that will go to the terminal storage. Uh, this project was split into two bid components. The production well is uh, ongoing, we're finishing that up. We've completed the drilling at that location and recently completed the uh, efficiency and pump test. Now we're moving into the pump design and fabrication stage. The second part is the construction of this pipeline that will take water from the production well to the terminal storage. And we just th the, the decision to split this work into two different parts was uh, because of the, the distinct construction responsibilities and also to ensure that the pipeline still had a warranty when we actually put the project in service. The fiscal year 2018 operating plan includes the $700,000 for the pipeline construction and all of these expenses are currently approved within the FY 2018 budget. I'll take any questions and then I have a resolution to read. Anybody have any questions? Read your resolution, please. Yes, sir. Be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brathis River Authority hereby approves the execution of the construction contract for the East Wimson County Water Treatment Plant Production Well Pipeline by the General Manager CEO, provided that construction contract amount, together with contingency, does not exceed $700,000. You've heard the resolution. Is there a motion to adopt? Uh, Floor is second by Hubert. Hubert. Please poll the board. President Officer Scott? Yes. Director Ball? Yes. Director Bell? Yes. Director Adams? Yes. Director Bennis? Yes. 
Director Christian? Yes. Director Flores? Yes. Director Grant? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? I'm staying. Director Zagnina? Yes. Agenda item number 13. Discussion and possible action on Lower Brazos River Flood Protection Planning Study by Brad Brunette, Water Service Manager. Yes, sir. What we're going to be asking for today with this item is authorization to contribute an additional $70,000 to incorporate data and information from Hurricane Harvey into the ongoing Lower Basin Flood Protection Planning Study. Uh, some of you may recall having seen this before. We began this study back in 2014. Actually, uh, during the drought, the, the drought was still in effect at that time, and I recall, you know, as we were talking about this study uh, with with other folks, you know, the question of what, you know, what do we need a flood study for? We're in the middle of this drought, but unfortunately, we've seen uh, all too much here lately why we need uh, these flood studies and flood models and that kind of thing. The board had previously authorized us to manage this study and also submit grant applications to the Texas Water Development Board. And then most recently, back in January of 2016, y'all authorized us to contribute $151,166 to the study effort. Uh, the purpose of this is to update and develop consistent floodplain information from about the Hempstead area all the way down to the coast. The study work is being conducted by HALF Associates and is being funded by the Texas Water Development Board, a number of local entities down in that part of the basin and BRA. It's been conducted in two phases. You can see there on the map, the green color was the phase one portion of the study and that was primarily done in 2014 to 2016 and focused on the area from Richmond down to the coast. And then more recently in 2016 to 2018, phase two focused on the area from Hempstead down to Richmond. And what we're going to get out of this study essentially is new models, data, flood maps, and flood reduction alternatives that will be helpful for flood forecasting and emergency response when we're having events like Harvey, uh, but also for regulating future development down in this part of the basin along the river. Uh, the information from the models in the study have already been put to use. You know, we're not through yet, but both in the 2016 floods and also here recently in Harvey, uh, we were providing copies of our model to the Corps of Engineers and to the emergency managers down in that area and we're generating inundation maps with those models during the flood efforts. Uh, we've also had a number of entities that have requested copies of the models for their particular studies or work that they're doing that uh, this directly relates to. So it's a, it's a, a, a good effort that we're involved in I think is going to have a long-term good use down in that part of the basin. One last note here on the map, you can see Allen's Creek located there on the map. One of the things that we're going to have to do once we start the permitting work for Allen's Creek is, is focus on the flood effects of that reservoir. Uh, we're essentially going to be building the dam for Allen's Creek Reservoir down in the floodplain close to the river, and so we're going to have to closely evaluate the impacts of that dam on flooding in this part of the basin. And so the study work that we're doing here will be directly applicable to what we're going to have to do for Allen's Creek, you know, maybe on a more localized basis there, but uh, we'll definitely be able to take advantage of some of what we've done here. This is, yes, ma'am. Update due to Harvey, the lower study, because you already have the finish, but there were changes, I'm, I'm positive, there were changes and there should be changes to the map and to the areas that actually flooded during 2017. <laughs> so I'm wondering, are you going to update those yeah, while you're doing the rest? We're, we're providing the model. We're going to update our model and we're proposing here to incorporate the Harvey data to calibrate the model with this storm. Okay. We're not actually updating the official FEMA <laughs> floodplain maps, but the study is being done to that level of standard so that if any of the entities in the lower Brazos want to take this study and apply to FEMA to update their maps, they'll be capable of doing that. But it covers such a large area, we're leaving that decision up to the, to the local jurisdictions. We're just providing the, the model and the maps for them to use however that they see fit. So it would have to be a county or would it be a city like, for instance, Richwood flooded, Freeport did not, parts of Lake Jackson and a lot of Brazoria flooded, but then there are other areas that did not. And so I, I'm, I'm wondering if, is it the city that would go and ask to have it redone or would it be the county or? It's my who? understanding if, it, if the 
area that you're talking about is within the incorporated city limits of a city uh -huh. the city would be responsible for requesting to fema to update the map in that area if it's in the unincorporated parts of the county it would be the county floodplain administrator the county's responsibility to do that i don't even know if they're aware they may be very aware of what we're doing here but i haven't it, read anything about them using our information or wanting to have our maps updated it seems like something I might want to talk to somebody. Yeah, uh, it's a it's a water development board grant funded project, and so we you know we've been having really well attended meetings with folks down in that part of the basin since okay. we started in 2014, and so I know uh, there are a number of folks both in Brazoria and Fort Bend and Waller and Austin County that are tuned into this. Yeah, but we're not quite to the end yet, and so maybe that's why you haven't uh, you know heard of, about changes because we're not we're not finished yet. Okay. Uh, ultimately, in 2018. Uh, we were scheduled to be done in March, but by adding this data, we're looking at extending the timeline to about September of next year. Uh, but I think I think you will see results from this study being used by you know different entities again, all the way from Hempstead down to the coast going forward. Okay. This is just some of the, the scope items. I'm not going to go through the individual details of what we're proposing to do, but when you look back, we've had two of the largest floods in the last hundred years have happened in back-to-back -back years in this part of the basin in 2016 and 2017. And we have a rare opportunity while we're doing a study like this. It's unusual that you actually have a flood of this magnitude where you have such good information about high water marks and photographs to calibrate the models that you're trying to build to predict this kind of thing. And we've uh, been fortunate in terms of the study that we've had two of those large storms, the 2016 event and now Hurricane Harvey. And with the incorporation of Hurricane Harvey, it was a different type of storm than the 2016 flood. And so that's, that gives us some advantages too. We're not, we're not calibrating our model just for this one event. We've got two large events and they were different. And so to the extent we can calibrate the model to both of them, we'll have a, a better product there. Uh, the cost to, to do this that we're looking at is $110,000. Again, we're looking about another six months to this total study effort. This slide shows a breakdown of the funding for the effort to date. The first row is the current scope of work funding for phases one and two. So you can see almost 800,000 has been funded by the Water Development Board, uh, 643,000 from the local entities. And you can see the local entities that are actually participating financially are listed there on the bottom of the slide. Uh, you, all, you guys authorized us to participate for 151, 166 back in January of 2016. And then the second row there is the cost for adding Hurricane Harvey. Uh, we've got $40,000 available from local contributions to help with that effort. And then the 70,000 there is what we're asking you to authorize BRA to contribute to help uh, fully fund that effort. You know, there are a lot of those entities down there. Some of you folks live down there and are a lot more familiar with it than, than we are here, but a lot of those entities are still uh, struggling with recovery. And so uh, we feel like this is a good, a good faith gesture by us to try to, you know, help in some way with the, the floodplain effort and the, you know, dealing with future floods going forward. I think that's all I have. I have a resolution, but I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. So yes, sir. <laughs> pales in comparison but has there been any flood studies on the upper upper basin we had a pretty good flood for us a couple of years ago yeah we actually had a, a flood protection planning study done at the lake granbury area that went from the dennis gauge just upstream of granbury down to the dam that we were involved in probably in 2008 or 2009 it was before some of these you know more recent floods that we've seen up there but i, I know fema has been looking at some floodplain work above Possum Kingdom, but I'm not sure what the status of it is, but nothing of, of this magnitude. Anybody else? Read your resolution, please. Be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby authorizes the General Manager slash CEO to contribute up to $70,000 to expand the scope of work of the Lower Brazos River Flood Protection Planning Study to incorporate data and information from Hurricane Harvey into the ongoing study effort. And be it further resolved that the General Manager slash CEO is authorized to negotiate and execute any required amendments to contracts or interlocal, interlocal agreements with the Texas Water Development Board, Half Associates, Inc., or local area financial participants that are necessary to facilitate the expanded scope of work. Uh, John Henry, please pull the board. 
Yes. Presenting Officer Scott? Yes. Director Bob? Yes. Director Bell? Yes. Director Adams? Yes. Director Venice? Yes. Director Christian? Yes. Director Flores? Yes. Director Grant? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Lamore? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Zanahita? Yes. Agenda item number 14, discussion and possible action. State Planning Development Manager and Brad Brunette, Water Service Manager. Just uh, to uh, give you some background, uh, in April of 2003, you authorized the general manager to enter into consulting contracts with uh, uh, several firms to, uh, to pursue the system operation permit. We actually filed our permit application in June of 2004, and we got the final order on that permit in September of 2016. And as Mike McClendon very ably pointed out, it took us a little bit longer to, uh, to get here than we originally anticipated. <clears throat> One of the consultants we use is, uh, is Freeze and Nichols to do all our hydrology. Uh, they're very capable. They're uh, very uh, acknowledged uh, throughout the state. Uh, uh, and the people that have worked on our permit uh, from Freeze and Nichols have been top rate. Uh, the original amount of that contract uh, that we uh, negotiated with them following the April approval and, and contract was signed by Mr. Ford in, Ar in August of 2003 was right at $2.6 million. Since that time, we've made uh, amendments to that contract as, uh, as the process evolved. Uh, those will not all add to this number. There actually was a, uh, a reduction to the contract at, at, at one time. But uh, if you go down to the most recent uh, uh, amendment that, uh, that you authorized, which was to have Freeze and Nichols prepare a, a drought study that was required by the permit, uh, we stand at uh, about $4.1 million. <clears throat> the final order from the commission required uh, some changes uh, to the permit. Uh, and the water management plan to bring them into conformance uh, with the, uh, the finally adopted permit. We are very close uh, to having those completed. Uh, unfortunately, we find ourselves about $30,000 short in, uh, in contract authorization. And part of what I'm going to request from you today is to, uh, is to increase uh, this $4.1 million by another $30,000 to uh, to, to finish up the, the permit uh, and the water management plan and get that filed with, uh, uh, with TSEC. <clears throat> the system operation permit has been described by almost everybody involved as the most complex uh, water right permit application ever filed in the history of the state of Texas. Uh, it's unique. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we're asking you to, to authorize us to, uh, to have Freeze and Nichols develop an analytical tool <clears throat> All our water rights prior to the system operation permit were contained in reservoirs. So it's very easy to know how much water is there and where it is and how often it's there and, and how much you have uh, the ability to use. The system operation permit authorizes us to divert water from 27 different stream segments throughout the basin. And those are uh, stream segments uh, are designed to take advantage of, uh, of, of previously uh, available flows uh, that had not been permitted uh, wastewater uh, plant uh, return flows and other sources of water that uh, that the permit authorized us to access in order to uh, to meet contracts and, and, and customer demands. Uh, right now, we have a waiting list uh, in hand of, of customers who would probably buy immediately uh, 200 to 300,000 acre feet of water if we had it available. We think the system operation permit uh, will uh, will offer about 100,000 acre feet of water to meet those needs. Uh, the other needs will be uh, evolving into the future. <clears throat> this, uh, when we uh, started talking to Freeze and Nichols about uh, what the model would look like, they sent us this simplified diagram. Uh, and uh, but but what it does, it it it, it does take various elements of the. Uh, 
of the water management plan and the permit, uh, the return flows I was talking about, our, our own uh, existing water rights, and it works through a simulation in order to define exactly how much water is available in each one of those stream segments. Uh, each segment is unique. Uh, it has specific requirements for environmental flows, for example. Each segment has other water rights that are, uh, that are diverting from that stream segment. Uh, it has contracts from the BRA that are already diverting there. And then it has anticipated contracts that, that we will be modeling to make sure that when we make those decisions and those, we enter into those decades-long water supply contracts that we are uh, confident that we'll be able to meet, uh, meet the needs as, as they are uh, as they're stated in those contracts. <clears throat> More specifically, uh, what we'll look at is, is, is what's at going on in each stream segment. Uh, we'll look at system efficiency. We'll incorporate uh, certain non-permit uh, and non-regulatory uh, activities, such as the, uh, the PK Granberry balancing protocol. We'll look at what the Corps does with not only flood releases, but also when they make uh, releases through the dam at, uh, at Lake Whitney for hydropower. And then we'll uh, bring all these uh, activities in and create, uh, again, a, a tool that, uh, that when we go out to our customers, we're confident that uh, if someone wants X number of uh, acre feet in, in stream segment Y, that we can contract successfully. Any questions? Yes, sir. It's really more for her. Just kind of, what is our over? Not just this, but we, we got a lot of stuff going with Freeze and Nichols, and some of it was kind of, when we last talked about it, at least semi-controversial. What is our overall relationship with them right now? We have really split the two issues, um, basically, with regard to our engineers. Can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Richard. <laughs> We still have several contentious issues with that firm, um, and we are in the process of potentially work, working on a mediation with them on one of our projects. We have not been utilizing them on the sort of engineering design build for construction since we had a lot of problems. However, they were with us from the beginning of SysOps, and we have continued in that process and have kind of split the two houses. Fair statement. And from everything I've heard, Jim's been extremely satisfied with their performance, and we have not had any issues. So we have sort of continued that process because I think of the amount of time and effort and so forth that's gone into it. But on the other issues, we're still pursuing the claims that we have. We don't lose any leverage on any of this stuff because of this. They're two separate deals. That's how we've treated it. That's very generous of us. Very much by necessity, I think. Very much well, by necessity. Well, I understand we're kind of in bed with them on this deal because of the length of... Decades. Of, yes. <laughs> but That's, it's still... You know, but we've not... It's. Sir, I will tell you this. It has to kind of hurt to write them a check over here when you're dealing with them over there. That's what you call... And we are in no way relinquishing any claims, I can tell you that. We are very rigorously pursuing the claims that we have on the projects that have problems, and we do not intend to come off of that. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing yeah. none, read your resolution, please. The following resolution is presented for consideration to the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority for adoption at its October 30, 2017 meeting. Be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brass River Authority hereby authorizes the General Manager slash CEO to amend the existing contract with Friesen Nichols, Inc. to add an additional $30,000 for work related to the filing of the Water Management Plan, Accounting Plan, and other related documents to bring those documents into conformance with the System Operation Permit as approved by the Commissioners of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and be it further resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby authorizes the General Manager slash CEO to amend the existing contract with Freeze and Nichols, Inc. to add an additional $350,000 for the creation of a modeling tool to evaluate future long-term water contracting decisions from the Brazos River Authority water supply system with inclusion of the system operation permit. You heard the resolution, a motion to adopt. So moved. Richard. Uh, Jeannie. Right. Please poll the board. President, Officer Scott? Yes. Director Ball? Yes. Director Bell? Yes. Director Adams? Yes. Director Bennis? Yes. 
Director Christian? Yes. Director Flores? Yes. Director Graham? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Zacanino? Yes. Bill? Is it lunchtime? Yes. Let's break for lunch.
The Board of Directors will conduct a closed meeting and executive session on the following matters. A, to deliberate the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property in Austin County in relations to Allen's Creek Reservoir, pursuant to the authority granted by Section 551.072 of the Texas Open Meetings Act, codified as Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code. B, <clears throat> to deliberate regarding the following positions, General Manager slash CEO, Technical Service Manager, Chief Financial Officer, Human Resources Manager, General Counsel, Government and Customer Relations Manager, Upper Basin Regional Manager, Central and Lower Basin Regional Manager, Information Technology Manager, and Planning and Development Manager, pursuant to the authority granted by Section 551.074 of the Texas Open Meeting Act, codified as Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code. If you are not specifically involved in the presentation of the executive session agenda item, please excuse yourself from the boardroom at this time.
got to read the red version. Nope. Check out there. No, just check out there. Ready? Okay. The board of directors hereby reconvenes into open session at 1.20 p.m. She got it. Monica, please read your resolution. Whereas the general manager, CEO, Phil Ford, has advised the board of directors that he intends to retire his employment with the Brazos River Authority in April 2018, whereas the board of directors desires to initiate the process of an executive search for the replacement of the general manager, CEO, and whereas the Board of Directors wishes to ensure that the executive search process yields the most qualified applicant pool to facilitate a smooth transition in leadership for the Brazos River Authority. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby instructs the Human Resources Manager to initiate the executive search process by performing the activities set forth in this resolution and authorizes the Executive Compensation and Evaluation Committee to select candidates for interview. The Human Resources Manager shall initiate the executive search process as follows. Post vacancy announcement on November 1st, 2017. Advertise online and in the Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston newspapers for the first and second weekends in November. Review applications for minimum requirements. Coordinate with qualified candidates to complete a Profiles XT assessment. Verify the candidate's academic qualifications and perform reference verifications. Provide the Board of Directors all qualified candidates, resumes, applications, assessments, and results of reference verifications for review. Following the Executive Compensation and Evaluation Committee selection of candidates to be interviewed, coordinate interview schedule with candidates and conduct background screenings, and provide the Board of Directors selected candidates' resumes, applications, assessments, and results of reference verifications and background screenings prior to the date of the interviews. In addition, the Executive Compensation and Evaluation Committee shall review all qualified candidate information and select a list of candidates for interview by the Board of Directors. I've heard the reading of the resolution. Is there a motion to adopt? Forward and second by Bennett. Please poll the board. Uh, President Officer Scott? Yes. Director Ball? Yes. Director Bell? Yes. Director Adams? Yes. Director Bennett? Yes. Director Christian? Yes. Director Flores? Yes. Director Grant? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Lattimore? Uh, Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Zacanina? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> we'll be uh, electing the assistant or the vice presiding officer and a secretary. While well, we have seven directors serving as holdovers and appointments are pending, the bylaws provide that the election of officers shall occur at this meeting. So the next item is for the election of board of director officers. Discussion and possible action on election of Board Officers by Riley Woods, Senior Staff Attorney. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good, I guess, afternoon now. Um, good afternoon. OK, so oh, OK, either way. So we don't have to. Okay, so every 
odd numbered year, so every two years, you all will elect the, uh, assi uh, the assistant presiding officer and the secretary. And that's what this process here is. Um, under the provisions of Article 4 of the Brazos River Authority bylaws, the positions of assistant presiding officer and secretary are to be elected by the board of directors at the October regular meeting in each odd numbered year. The only, uh, or the primary rule associated with this is you can't serve consecutive terms unless there's a two thirds vote by the board. So that's the, and other than that, it's just a majority. Okay. And so I'll turn it over to All right. our presiding officer. In that regard, I would like to begin accepting nominations for the position of assistant presiding officer. Mr. Chairman, uh, with pleasure, I nominate Director Bell as the assistant presiding officer. Director, Director Bell. I'll second. Second. I don't think we need a second, do we, on this? Anyhow. Then I'm third. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Any more nominations? Hearing none, <clears throat> I would move to entertain a motion designating Leroy Bell as assistant presiding officer. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Motion was made and seconded. But let's see, who seconded it? I did. You did? But Venice, uh, please read the resolution. Give the song by the board of directors of the authority pursuant to the authority granted by Article 4 of the process of regulatory bylaws that Director Bell is hereby elected to serve as assistant presiding officer. The aforementioned officer shall serve for two years until successor is selected. <clears throat> Please poll the board. Presiding Officer Scott? Yes. Director Ball? Yes. Director Bell? Constrain. Director Adams? Yes. Director Venice? Yes. Director Christian? Yes. Director Flores? Yes. Director Grant? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Lamar? Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Lincoln? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Dallas? Well, yeah, yeah, I will. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you <he> did. <laughs> Director Taylor? Yes. Director Zanahan? Yes. Sort of. <laughs> this time, I would, like to begin in accept, I would like to begin accepting nominations for the position of secretary. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to nominate Sal Zacanino as secretary. Good. Are there any more? <coughs> any more nominations? No. Hearing none. <clears throat> I would move to entertain a motion designating Sal Zaccanino as secretary. So moved. Second. Second. All right. Motion was made and seconded. Please read the resolution. It's here resolved by the board of directors of the Brazos River Authority pursuant to the authority granted by Article 4 of the Brazos River Authority bylaws that Director Zaccanino is hereby elected to serve as secretary. The aforementioned officer shall serve for two years or until a successor is selected. That heard the resolution, please pull the board. Presiding Officer Scott? Yes. Director Ball? Yes. Director Bell? Yes. Director Adams? Yes. Director Venice? Yes. Director Christian? Yes. Director Flores? Yes. Director Grant? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Lattimore? Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Zaganino? Abstain. All right. I have a little thing I'd like to read to you. <laughs> About six months ago, Phil advised me of his upcoming retirement. In hearing from Phil about his plans to retire next year, I thought a lot about all that he has accomplished during his leadership with the Brazos River Authority. 
Let's go back in time. The year was 2001 when Phil took the responsibility of running the Brazos River Authority. His first act was to assemble a team that would take action to ensure the Brazos River mission of providing water for every expanding Texas population was accomplished. And over the past 16 years, Phil has led the way in accomplishing goals to ensure that success. It has not been easy, as some of you know. Director Johnson, Director Zaccanino, both appointed in 2001, have first-hand knowledge because they also met the challenge alongside Phil all these 16 years. If we think back on some of the challenges and accomplishment Phil, the staff, Director Johnson, and Zaccanino would probably name the decommissioning of the hydroelectric plant at Possum Kingdom Lake, addressing issues at the SWATS facility, Possum Kingdom divestitures, an enormous effort by the BRA as directed by the Texas legislature to get the BRA out of the land management business. Systems operation permit, probably the most innovative and complex water rights ever written in the Texas history. <clears throat> this one has touched all of us at some time for the past 13 years. Graham Project, another flood control activity that involved partnering with the other government entities over the course of the last decade to address flooding issues at the city of Graham, Texas. Remediation of the Williams County Regional Raw Water Line after extensive construction issues. And just to thank of all the number of directors that have come on board during this period, 67 to be exact. <laughs> now, Phil's job is to oversee the operation of the BRA as far as the water selling and the government uh, contacts and so forth, but he also has to assist and educate these new directors, and that in itself is a full-time job. <laughs> Phil's accomplishment go on and on, but now let's, let's focus on the future, as that is precisely what Phil has done during his leadership and management of the BRA. He has examined and pursued many possibilities in acquiring, establishing additional water sources beyond the system's operation permit. And that work continues with the <coughs> Conjuncture Use Project and the Allen's Creek Project. Texas and the Bradish River Authority have benefited greatly from the visions of the fields for the future and leadership in taking us there. In conclusion, I would like to extend our deepest appreciation and thanks to Phil Ford for his inherent leadership, integrity, dedication, service, and all that he has accomplished for the BRA and the state of Texas. So Phil, on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority, thank you for your service. I think the next agenda is to adjourn. What you want to? Oh yeah. Yeah. Remind everybody to leave your iPad with your user ID and your uh, password. You'll have a new one before you come back. So please, please leave it for the staff to take care of. Thank you. All right. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. We're adjourned.